Well, good afternoon, and I, uh, I'm aware that, uh, like our last webinar, this is streaming into the Rock Castle room, so uh, if you yell loud enough, we might be able to hear you up here, but uh, it's, um, it's, it's a subject today that um, anyone that hears me lecture at South Pacific or talk in meetings, I'm a self-confessed recovery nerd these days, and uh, one of the people that changed my life is uh, Pia Melody in this program. And so today, the webinar is called Breaking Free, Recovery from Developmental Trauma. And it's going to talk about the resources that we use at South Pacific that our inpatient program is based on. And it's going to talk about, specifically about the tool Breaking Free, which is the workbook that goes with facing codependence. And that's our Life Skills 2 program at the moment that uh, I've ran the first couple to get it off the ground. Sherilyn Drayton runs them now. And, and it's always a, a pleasure for any therapist here to do that group because it, it just deals with the core principles of this issue. So welcome, settle into the Rock Castle room. I hope you've had a great lunch down there. For people that are joining us online, uh, welcome. And for people that are listening to this after the fact from our YouTube channel, I hope your recovery is going well. And, and if uh, if you're struggling in any way at the end of this presentation, there will be some information to contact us here at South Pacific or please reach out to the people that support you. So today, what I want to, if I get started, um, when I hear Pia Melody lecture, it's it's sort of funny, I suppose, in a weird way, but she says, um, to, to get recovery, it, we have to turn up. So I've, I've heard her start lectures by saying, well, thank you for turning up. It's the first step. And, and meaning by that, that a lot of people are too ashamed to turn up or they're lost in the delusion and the denial of, of the seriousness of um, either the impact of their trauma or their ad addictions or mental health issues that, that just turning up's too hard. They're lost in the insanity of um, self real run riot. So if you're sitting here and listening to this today, thank you for turning up because you're doing something good for yourself, even if it might feel unpleasant. The next, the next reality, and uh, I know over at the Meadows, which is where Pia Maliti is still a, a consultant and senior fellow, um, they have the phrase in their books that uh, mental health is a commitment to reality at all costs, which is a saying by M. Scott Peck, who uh, one of his books was A Road Less Travelled. And, and so there's, there's a decision that we have to make to grow up. I think family, friends, loved ones sometimes drop us off at the door of SPP. But when we walk through that door, this journey really is up to us. And um, people can watch and, and send us lovely flowers or cards. Some of us have burned a lot of bridges, so we don't even get those well wishes. But the decision to, to sort of turn up and then, and then it's to grow up. And, and not in that old shaming way where sometimes people told you to grow up. It's, it, we're talking about a growing up where I'm going to develop some functional adult skills to support myself in a reparenting phrase, which I'll explain as we go through this. And facing our reality, Pia Melody um, explains that when she was discovering this model, to get a sense of reality, she literally stood in front of the mirror and thought, well, who am I? And, um, and, and she, she quite simply put it together as I'm a result of my body, my nervous system, my neurosystem, system, my viscera, my muscular system. I'm, I'm all that data collecting. I'm my consciousness and mind. I'm my feeling states and I'm my choices and behaviors. And so we're going to look at, at, at how that reality um, got impacted through childhood trauma and then how the 12 steps and um, sort of tuning into a recovery lifestyle can um, uh, help you. The model is something that uh, I want to talk about today in a way from its 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 beginnings and um, uh, we usually tell the story of this model by its its bottom line because it tells a left to right story of, of, of how this model can help you. Uh, when Pia Melody uh, got sober, uh, she was working as a nurse and it's not uncommon for people to come from family systems where there was dysfunction and then be in a hero role and, and then go on to try and help others. But she got sober and she, but she was still in a lot of rage. And so when she eventually started to put the pieces together, when this model was put together, it was for a map. Um, I know it's a confusing thing to look at when you come in, but once you get the piece of this, pieces of this puzzle um, personally, once you understand uh, what the wound has been for you, once you understand how you've adapted and the defenses uh, that you have and how they affect you, the, the different uh, secondary symptoms of mental health issues and uh, 
uh, addiction issues, etc., uh, start to create an impact in your life, this map all of a sudden just comes alive. And so um, what we'll talk about today is that children need healthy parenting to develop and maintain certain attitudes and beliefs. And the, the main ones that she discovered was around their sense of value that leads to their self-esteem, their sense of vulnerabilities, because children from the younger stage are completely dependent, completely vulnerable uh, on, on the care of others. And then over time, they get to become you know, more active in their own care. But we're incredibly vulnerable and the, the, the being kept safe and then learning how to keep yourself safe leads to personal boundaries. That, that learning that around our reality that I explained before that we're perfectly imperfect as human beings and that we're going to make mistakes and we're going to put ourselves first at times at the at the the um, to in at the damage of others and and then in, in that imperfection we'll need to be able to own it and identify it that we're completely dependent and then hopefully through good and healthy parenting we grow into interdependency and that if we can get all the above, children are generally age appropriate and they're spontaneous and open and they know that anything that they need in their environment as they go along is, is provided for them. What interferes with that is a ch childhood lack of nurturing trauma or abuse and neglect and 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 this is where when Pia Melody and I'll tell her story in a second uh, looked into her own story she started to see that the neglect and the trauma that we're looking at isn't what society classically looks at trauma and certainly back in this day in the the late 70s and 80s when she was piecing this together trauma was basically physical assault or sexual assault and molestation and there wasn't a lot of uh, interest in shaming and emotional abuse and intellectual abuse. Uh, and, and so when she looked at this, she saw it was very significant that, that there was across the board, overt and covert abuse can cause this developmental immaturity. And she says that, that, that it creates a wound around the esteem. It creates a wound around our vulnerability and our rebelliousness and our dependency issues. And we have a sense of ourselves being out of control. And she called that the wounded child. There is no wounded child inside of us, but there's a state inside of us, an ego state that's immature that we can get triggered into, and I'll describe this through its symptoms later on. And so the wounded child reflects how we felt during problematic childhood experiences. Now, when this model developed, was developed, there was no neuroscience to base this on. It was experiential. It was gained by watching and learning and seeing how people were in treatment when they gave up their medications like alcohol or food or gambling and, and the things that came up for them. What we also noticed is, uh, uh, probably finishing that thought, that, that now what we know about the brain and memory and memory systems and implicit memory that can get triggered, especially if you've got uh, complex uh, post-traumatic stress as a result of childhood trauma, that you can have a whole wave of emotion comes up that leaves you feeling completely out of control, literally, that your sort of um, frontal cortex sort of flips its lid, as Dan Siegel says. And, and so that wounded child now is, we've got a lot of scientific evidence to see just how we are uh, at depth impacted by trauma. But back at this point, it was it, she described it as it reflected how we felt, the felt sense, not just the feeling, but the way that your body responded, which is what our neuroscientists are telling us now about trauma. It stores itself in the body. Eventually, in a family system, though, you will learn to adapt, and that's the other part of the jargon with uh, this model, is the adapted adult child reflects the way we were parented. So in this stress time, when the parents are acting in stress or in trauma, we look around the family system and we start to pick up how the family keeps itself safe, albeit dysfunctional, but it's a survival mechanism. Uh, there's a fantastic resource by a, a therapist from San Francisco called Pete Walker and he's, he calls his book Complex Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder from, th from Surviving to Thriving, Learning to Move Out of These Survival Techniques and that's a lot of what uh, Pia's work and treatment was about early on, to, to, to notice where people were in survival and needed to, to learn the skills so they could start to really live in the moment and thrive. Now these two things, untreated, uh, untreated primary symptoms lead to secondary symptoms and they result in current crisis, unmanageability and memory loss, sorry, uh, intimacy issues. Now in, in, in this, uh, as uh, uh, if people have heard me talk on this before, 
people generally arrive in treatment with in a current crisis and, and evidence of unmanageability. We we don't usually show up with a smile on our face looking at the pamphlet thinking this is a good idea for 21 days. We turn up here because there's been a crisis, something's not working and, and generally we're, go, we're going to have evidence of intimacy issues. Either the current relationships we're in are under a lot of stress and damage or relationships are broken down to the point where we do come in here and there's not much support for us. What we do is we know we need to get folks help for the secondary symptoms because some of those secondary symptoms, if it's a, an, an opiate addiction or a, a benzodiazepine addiction, they can kill us if we don't get a, 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 a extreme alcoholism where we get the delirium tremors. These things can kill us if we're not careful. So we really have to take secondary symptom recovery really seriously. But but. Where we're just about to head in this webinar is the untreated primary symptoms and, and, and how Pia got curious about those in her own life and how she started to discover them with others and literally how she's, the, the, the workbooks that we use, the fact that our owner went over there and, and Bill and Lorraine Wood bought the program back is all through Pia discovering this for herself. And, and, and from that discovery and her starting to work with folks, in the beginning they didn't really have a way out. But she just thought, well, if we can find what this problem is and keep talking and keep the discussion going and, and let's try things and see what works. And in the end, uh, she worked out that through treatment, recovery, intimacy and reparenting, we need to develop a functional adult, which is the last part of our jargon. And it's that triangle of functional adult needs to reparent that wounded child and adult adapted child. And, and that's the grief issue of this model. Model. It, it's it's she she uh, she grabbed one phrase and owns it now I believe with with saying that <coughs> there's a joy pain to recognizing this issue if you've got it <coughs> excuse me guys because it's 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 painful to to recognize that you belong in this model uh, but it's also joyful when you start to talk about it and find a way out of being trapped in that bondage of self that alcoholics anonymous so neatly packages as a way of experiencing this powerlessness inside over who you are and so outlined in the functional adult and we'll get to that throughout this webinar is that that regarding a self esteem and personal boundaries learning uh, about our, our reality and how to tune into it and how to own it and contain it and share it appropriately, identifying needs and wants and appropriately getting them met for ourselves and others interdependently. Uh, it brings us back to that spontaneity and openness that, that we see in children that's so adorable about the that innocence of ch that childhood state that we can get that back as an adult through through that treatment, recovery, intimacy and reparenting. The, the books that we have, um, if anything I say in this webinar resonates with you, if you get some of that joy pain, then these are the books. The, the, the Facing Codependence uh, really is naming the problem. It was the first book that she did. Um, uh, the, the book we sell here is the revised edition and she gives a nice little interlude of 13 years after she revised it. Some of the other lessons that she learned around boundaries and, uh, and, and sharing of your reality, and, uh, which is interesting to read. But I think the most important thing in this book is, is Pia's story. Uh, and then she developed the Breaking Free book because she realized a couple of things and I'll talk about them through the webinar that, that this is a hard um, this is a hard thing to track codependency. It's a hard thing to, to identify it and I'll talk why as we go through this and it's a hard thing even when you do get into recovery to see your progress. So Breaking Free became a workbook in three sections that, that helped you identify um, uh, identify and break through the denial of your past to look at the 12 steps as a tool for seeing how we impact others with our codependency, that adult adapted child and wounded child now impacts other people and then the, the, the part three is about growing those functional adult skills. Briefly in the front of um, the, the the facing codependence, Pia tells a story and I'll, I'll badly plagiarise it as, as much as I have the desire to read it because I think it's really interesting. She got sober as, a, as an alcoholic and, and focused like a lot of people back then just on the alcoholism. She got sober, thought the problem was dealt with and, and went about her business. And she worked uh, at the Meadows, uh, at, before it had any of this information, it bases itself in this program now, but before they had this information, like a lot of treatment centres, they work with the secondary symptoms and addiction issues and, and uh, post-traumatic stress and, and, and they, they dealt mainly with, with what you could see when people walked through the door. 
But she started to get in trouble with some of the secondary symptoms that you see, that rage was a big issue for her. Relationships were really difficult and painful. She had difficulty uh, containing herself and difficulty not being injured by the reality of others. And it, it came to the crunch where they actually suggested she go off somewhere for treatment. But when she was at that treatment centre, she could see that, that uh, not only didn't they have a program that helped her understand herself, she, she had the feeling that when she, she, she writes in Facing Codependence, that when she went to speak to the people at the, the uh, treatment centre, it felt they, they, like they were just confused by her, that they looked back at her. And when she was in that rage, when she was in that adult adapted child, which isn't attractive, but when she was in it, she, she, she tells, tells the story in the book that it just felt like they thought that she was a petulant child and they, and they just wanted her to go away. And, and I know that sometimes that can be a battle when we're in treatment and all our defences come up and, and it's not a pretty side and relationally even while we're in treatment we come up against struggles with uh, um, other clients or we come up with struggles against staff and, and you'll hear us say a crazy phrase which is this is a therapeutic opportunity and it absolutely is. This, this, does, this disease plays its, itself out in, our, in the way we do relationships and so those relationships that happen here are really important to helping us see what our defences are and what our walls are and what are some of those shame messages that we have and they can be awful to have to deal with but really important for your recovery. So Pia got curious and, and she came back from that treatment and she was angry. She was angrier now than she was before and she even went to try and explain this to the, the clinical director and, and, uh, and she had sort of a spiritual experience. They basically got fed up with the two and she said she was, even when she wrote it, she was hurt recollecting that day where she walked away knowing that she'd sort of lost uh, the, these two people that she really respected. But they said something challenging, just out of frustration. Why don't you go and invent it then, what you need? And as she walked away, she said she had a moment of clarity where she said, well, what did the, what did the guys in AA do? What did they do? And, and she realised that, well, they got together and they started talking about it. And out of that, they worked a way out. And so she um, started to, she, she let the intake know, look, send anyone to me that comes in. And it, she told the primary therapist that anyone that comes in with developmental trauma, send them my way. Send, and, and she started that conversation. And uh, long story short, she said so many people started coming to her office that, that it was taking up too much of her time because she wasn't a therapist, she was a nurse. So she, she asked the clinical director, could I just do a lecture and a workshop and the rest is history. That, that, uh, the, the lecture became uh, uh, Permission to be Precious and it's a six uh, CD series they still have online there uh, as, many, as well as many other resources that she's developed over the years. But she started to do that, that, that workshop there and it expanded and then she started to do it around the world. Uh, th that was uh, a change the way the Meadows did treatment. All of a sudden they were looking for these underlying symptoms, those primary symptoms and the, the, the way she describes it is, is that the secondary symptoms, is, it's a bit like giving a, a, a Panadol for the flu that you might be able to lessen some of the symptoms in the minute but without dealing with the infection with an antibiotic that the infection will still live on and once that, that Panadol wears off, you're still back in those symptoms and, and in, in, the, in that discomfort that, that leads to those secondary symptoms. And that's what was happening. People had come in, they'd go into treatment, get into a cotton wool environment and, and last the 21 days, but when they left and went back to the stress of their life, because those primary symptoms weren't cha uh, changed, that stress triggered that, 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 that internal inability to be able to live inside their own skin comfortably and before you knew it, they knew how to feel better. That drink or that drug, that gamble, that sex, that food, that spending, all those symptoms came back and the relationships in particular never got better. So I suppose what happened there, and we were very fortunate, and Lorraine uh, uh, was in the Rock Castle room yesterday and is the, the co-founder of, of, of South Pacific. We've been here since 93, and the, the whole reason we exist is because uh, Bill, who was a year sober when they met, um, got into a situation where he stopped going to meetings. Uh, as Lorraine tells the story quite publicly, um, uh, got into that dry drunk phase, sought some support, and due to a health issue was suggested he went to a hospital setting, which we didn't have anything like this in Australia at the time, and he ended up at the Meadows.
Now, part of the meadows, as some of you guys in the, uh, that are listening who have been through SPP might know, or you might have it coming up as family program. And in family program, uh, it ended up that, that, that a lot of their family members went through that program. And, and Lorraine tells, tells a, the wonderful story of her own intervention where they said, look, we think you should come in. Because this is a family disease and it's the enablers can be, as Lorraine says, just as sick as the alcoholics and at times sometimes sicker because at least the alcoholic gets to get drunk. The enabler is on 24-7 carrying the stress. And so she had her own journey there. And um, the, the, the story goes that Bill said, geez, it would have been cheaper for us all to go to have to build a rehab back in Australia and that must have planted a seed because the story of SPP started. And they bought this program back here and there was nothing like it. And they didn't know where to put it. And we were that kooky little rehab over in the beaches that uh, if you walked in with one addiction, you walked out with three. And if you, uh, and that we rabbited on a lot about childhood. And yet now, 22 years later, as we're about to go into our second generation, those two things are best practice trauma treatment right now. Uh, with addictions, uh, Dr. Patrick Carnes, um, who's the, the, the creator of the General Path Program at the Meadows, the Sex Addiction Program, a, a process addiction uh, 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 master, I would say. Uh, he, he says that with his statistics now over 40 years of research, that 87% of people with one addiction have two or more because of the way the brain um, responds in regards to addictive process, whether it be uh, process addiction or, or chemicals, and that 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 the, the statistics are overwhelming. That that this is a generational disorder for for in most occurrences. That 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 if you've got a secondary symptom, that that we can look broadly at those underlying issues. And when we look at uh, these underlying issues, the uh, what can come up, and we come up against that, that that stigma around, well, trauma and abuse, well, obviously, that's just physical or sexual abuse. Well, that didn't happen to me, so how can I have had trauma? But we know now that, um, that as I said before, uh, that she made it a lot broader, the impact on children, that, and it was the intellectual and, and, and emotional abuse that was really uh, impacting on children just as much, uh, and this was confirmed recently in the, the adverse childhood experience studies in the, in the uh, United States, the 17,500 people researched and they realised that, 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 that the shame from ongoing humiliation led to the same sort of post-traumatic stress symptoms as uh, sexual and physical abuse. But when Pia talks about this now, when this model was developed, she says there's two recoveries that need to take place for us to really change our life. One is from our history and one is from the disease. And when she describes it, she says that the secondary symptoms are the observable disease, the mental health, the, the, the addiction issues. But the, the primary symptoms are more the evidence of the immaturity that our energy as children got put into surviving and, and building adaptions than it did into growing and, and really changing. So. So when she um, put this together and she put Breaking Free together as a resource, because like with a lot of workbooks, people think, well, I'll work through that myself. And she said, well, look, some people are able to work through that workbook with the support of their peers uh, and their community, but some others need therapy. So how do you know? If you start to look back at your childhood and there's too much pain or shame, there's a secret back there. There's something that you're, um, uh, you haven't told anyone. And these are the folks that do remember and they know it doesn't feel good and it's overwhelming when they think about it. That They're at one end of the scale. The other one is though, that you're aware that you've lost a lot of memory back then. You're not sure. You've come in and you remember something at 11 and not much else. And, and what we know from the neuroscientists now, we can remember from 18 months onwards if we've got really good integration and really good attachment. So we get curious when there's a lot of memory loss because we know that the way the brain defends itself from stress is that we can re repress and suppress things and that as ch children, if we're under life-threatening situations as children, and that, that can be really different than what is uh, determined as a life-threatening situation for an adult because a little person can't leave a stressful situation where a big person can. And so it's not, it's never surprised me, especially when I used to run changes, uh, when we call, back when the days of survivors, that people would come in and, and they, um, 
had determined a lot of things to be really frightening that as an adult who could leave the situation might not have. And the other thing is that, is that memory loss. So if, you've, if you notice you've got those defences, then doing it with a therapist who might be able to give you a perspective or a reality check on the outside based on some of the things that you write and share could be really helpful. And as a result of um, that, that suppression and repression in our adult life, we can have evidence of minimisation and delusion or denial. And the the minimising is very common when people come in because we all like to make our, our, our we we make our family okay or normal or at least sort of go ah oh, look it happened to everyone back where I grew up so it wasn't that bad everyone got beaten or everyone got yelled at or everyone's house seemed to be crazy we can come up with all sorts of stories so if you if you notice that getting some professional help can be helpful. So in facing codependence, when Pia wrote that, it was at, it was at the end of you know developing that idea, speaking to lots of trauma survivors, starting to run workshops, and of course she was building it as she went, and she was very open about that, very humble about that. Uh, it started to to give us some clarity. So so facing codependence, when she wrote the book, helped identify the nature of children, what they needed to grow, uh, and and get the, to get their developmental needs met. That it then. Um, it looked at well, what happened when those underlying issues did not get met, and 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 uh, and that they started to see that that addiction or mental health issue as a result of those core issues. Um, that that when she started to broaden the definition of abusive or dysfunctional, less than nurturing parenting, she could see that 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 had a direct relationship with the low self esteem, the poor boundaries, the damaged sense of reality, the inability to meet needs and wants, and and moderation issues. And the other thing I think that codependency does a really great job at introducing is that there's a result, a, a resulting shame, a, and, and in particular a shame core, that where we meant to have, with healthy parenting, that sense of preciousness, that inherent worth, that my value just doesn't go up and down as I walk through my day as a result of other people. With folks that are impacted by this trauma, it does. And instead of having that inherent worth, there's a shame core that we'll see as a sense of inadequacy or superiority. And when that goes untreated, that's what we pass on generationally is this, this leading on to the way that parents then parent. The core issues that, that, that Pia was able to d define as the impact of childhood trauma, and I think sometimes codependency, uh, she says it's not really a contentious issue, but it's sort of confusing. People get, con well, what is it? And it's a very easy thing to define. And sometimes if someone's not clear, what's helpful about these uh, core issues and seeing them as clear as they are, is you mightn't remember all of your childhood or the sorts of trauma or abuse that could still be foggy. But if you can see these and relate to them, then that sort of gives you an indication that this is there was some impact in your childhood development. So sometimes just relating through the symptoms, if that's your doorway back, that's fine. And she said that the, the main five were difficulty experiencing, uh, you know, healthy and appropriate levels of esteem, difficulty setting functional boundaries, and she defines them as physical boundaries, internal boundaries around our thoughts and feelings and sexual boundaries, difficulty owning our reality, and, and owning it meaning <clears throat> being able to identify what's happening in our body. And for any healthy person, that sort of sounds strange, but if you've gone through developmental trauma, you can feel quite disconnected. And any addict that's sitting out there listening to this, well, addiction is all about disconnection. Difficulty acknowledge, acknowledging and meeting our own needs and wants, and then being interdependent with others. We're either um, you know, pulling away from others and being in sort of isolation, or we're enmeshed and really lost in relationships. So we don't do independency, interdependency well. And difficulty experiencing and expressing our own reality moderately, or being in the company of others and being able to take care of ourselves in that situation. So those core issues of codependency then go gave people a pathway to, um, to where to go um, in their treatment. And that's where she thought, well, okay, there's no one can fix that for you. And a lot of the 12-step fellowships that developed before this model did uh, got, got pretty clear in outlining that. They thought, well, that you, you know, to work the steps to get well, no one can do it for you. It's a decision you have to make for yourself in the first step. Um, it, it's 
a journey that you have to take on your own. You can do it in company of others, but basically the decision's yours. And and so she just said, look, in recovery we need to de we we can develop by healing those primary symptoms. Uh, a functional adult that then at, at its core starts to change. Now to do that, yes, we've got to have secondary symptom recovery. That's why she says there's two recoveries. I must um, if I'm if I'm an alcoholic, I, I I need to get into some abstinence and start to work a program around that. I'm not going to do this work while I'm drunk. I'm not going to do it while I'm stoned. I'm not going to do it while I keep switching off and 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 gambling or other process addictions. So it's I've got to get sober first from any of those addictions. If I've got an untreated mental health problem, I need to get into some maintenance and recovery around that and take care of that. So I give myself some stability to do this work. So it's esteeming uh, myself from within. That's my job now. It's not anyone else's job, and that's a big thing when you're a codependent. You're used to trying to get your value from others or blaming others for your low value. Uh, we've just got a little bit of a uh, flashing screen there, folks, so we'll just check that we've got power on and everything's going all right. Um, so I'll just uh, hopefully that's me just knocking the lead and uh, and and we'll in my enthusiasm. So I'll keep I'll keep going on regardless. So the the, <clears throat> the idea then is I've got to start to set boundaries and boundaries is something that Peter outlined in in facing codependence as the as the most important tool for somebody who's been primarily and fundamentally abused and had their boundaries violated, especially with sexual abuse or physical abuse because it leaves us vulnerable in our adult life to go on and find ourselves in dangerous situations and not having that internal sort of mechanism that lets us know that we're unsafe and we can go on then to repeat uh, either the be, being a, a victim of sexual or physical violence in our adult life. So she really, in facing codependence, outlines really clearly if that has happened, get support right now. In the revised edition, she says that that what she did notice though is that we really need to tune into what our reality is because that's what we set our boundaries off. So get that help if you're listening to this and finding boundaries really tough and ending up in dangerous situations, please reach out and get support. That we, we need to start to in, in, accept imperfection in ourselves and others. And that's, the, again, that's a big job and that's what we're just about to talk about. Become aware of, if anyone, if I lecture here on this model and just do the model in and of itself, I, I talk about what we have to, as Carl Jung says, uh, if we don't make the unconscious conscious, it will direct our life and we'll call it fate. So becoming aware can be a really painful situation. I know as a, as a, in my active addiction, I really love the fact that you could turn off with drugs and alcohol. So in recovery, tuning in and becoming aware of you and then others can be really painful but really necessary to get well. <clears throat> and again, the payoff is we get to be, we get our life back, we get to be spontaneous and open and, and, and that's a result of this functional adult. So, so let's, let's look at, well, that's facing codependency and that tells us, well, uh, okay, we've got work to do. How do we create that? Because that's not easy. And, and I think that when she wrote uh, Breaking Free, it was after she'd written Facing Codependence, was after working with a lot of codependent people and seeing that not only was this a hard disease to get to get back to and see where the injuries come from and and a hard disease to sort of see what the the impact of it was regarding our core issues, it was very hard to make progress in and to see progress in when you were getting well. And uh, there's a fantastic lecture of hers, you'll find it on YouTube and you can buy the MP3 from the, the Meadows it's, it, it, where she talks about mapping your recovery and she's talking live at a, uh, an adult children and alcoholics a conference about, well, how do you know if you're in recovery from this? And this Breaking Free book takes you just page by page right through it. It's a challenge. I must say when, when I, I came back to SPP this time and I started running this group, I really wanted to see it sort of get lift off the ground. I, I was overwhelmed in my own recovery. Every time I'd get to a new section, I'd think, wow, that's more work I've got to do. So it's very thorough. Um, and I want to go through what those three sort of parts of that book look like. The first section is you move beyond denial of your trauma history. As I said, we've got to get back through uh, delusion and denial and memory loss to, to, to see our history straight and, 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 and have the courage to do that because for some of us, there's some painful realities back there. Part two looks at moving beyond the denial of the symptoms of codependence. So once we get our history straight, we start to get a picture of just how big this thing can be. And uh, I've been seeing a few people recently that are dealing with their codependency and, and they're in that heartbreak, that first sort of few months of, of unpacking their history and just seeing 
the damage uh, that they've created inside themselves from the low self-esteem or the inability to set boundaries and the pain that just comes with the recognition of the injury that's happened over time because it feels like you just can't rebuild Rome quick enough. You can't get that functional adult going fast enough. And just when you think you've made some progress, we, we sort of snip, step on a snake and down we go and we've got to climb up another ladder. So it, uh, you know, what I like about the Breaking Free group is it really helps people come together and support each other. And I think that's what 12-step meetings do. You're not doing this journey alone. So moving beyond the denial of those symptoms and how they're affecting your life. And part three then is moving on beyond, beyond denial about your recovery, that we um, then need to move into recovery really actively and and um, and how do we do that so let's 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 truck on and just see when I pause folks it's because my lovely assistant here always never makes it onto the little square as Samantha Higgins uh, is, is it does all the hard work I'm telling you if it wasn't for her I'd be talking to nothing so um, she does all the clicking so I always want to like to mention her somewhere and she always knees me in the side of the leg most of the time so the first bit is the resistance to begin no one walks into South Pacific brimming with love and, and openness and honesty. We walk in here after we've tried usually every way we can deal with this. So when we start to, when we finally get in here and we start to look at facing codependence, the resistance can have a number of factors that we need to get over. Firstly, there's a lot of symptoms. It's overwhelming. Um, esteem, boundaries, it's all of us, our reality, our needs and wants. So it can, the sheer number can be overwhelming. When the defences that got us this far start failing and we start to see and feel the reality of what's really going on, so those boundaries where we used to be able to shut people out don't work and, and we can't shut down anymore and we get messy, um, just 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 seeing them failing and sometimes um, especially if you've got some shame or, ex or have shame existence binds we can get really overwhelmed and feel worse in recovery and it, I note that at the bottom we realize how big the symptoms are and and the slow the slow progress at times in recovery can be overwhelming and it can actually be once you get started in recovery it can be easier sometimes just to throw the, the game pieces up in the air and and be in our disease and you'll see that even in inpatient treatment where we we know we need to set a reality, we know we need to breathe and get grounded and get support, but we just go crazy. We just go, okay, blow it, that's it, I'm going to go and give someone a piece of my mind and we act out from adult adapted child or we tantrum from our wounded child. It's just easier sometimes than doing the work and reparenting and getting support because we'll be vulnerable if we do that. And this whole idea of being vulnerable is something that we've spent years running away from. And, uh, and so, so there can be resistance even just to starting. That idea of just how big it is, and I've always loved this, uh, John Bradshaw put together a, a map of recovery, and I've always liked this, uh, our visual artist, uh, Matt, got the, this image together for us and it's always an overwhelming image just to look at but but at that core where there would have been a preciousness there you know that, that if you're if ever spiritual belief you're a child of God but then the trauma can 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 cover that core with shame that we're just and that's what we can be quite powerless over those ego defenses on the outside of that circle the repression the suppression that the memory loss that saved us from sort of naught to seven uh, but then as we got that frontal cortex developed we learn this more sophisticated behavioural covers up later's cover cover ups later on. Those family roles that we talk about in our family program of what we learnt from the family of how to get our needs met when the adults were sort of under stress or less than nurturing or abusive. And then all those syndromes of shame further out, the, the addictions. And for some of us that might become a full-blown addiction but it's certainly a moderation issue. We're eating too much, we're, we're, we're drinking too much alcohol, we're gambling, we're working too much. Because uh, some folks come in and their, their, their addictions are quite overt and obvious and they're a real mess but then other folks walk in codependence and they look like they're, they're CEOs of companies and they look like they're going really well but it's this internal uh, this internal these internal symptoms that are driving it and and they might be they might be really successful by society standards but internally they're dying inside 
So Pia Melody, in a way, was ahead of her time, and I think same with the, the the vision of Bill and Lorraine Wood to bring this program back, because the you know the the idea to to, to look at these these uh, primary symptoms and look at childhood trauma was absolutely not popular, criticised highly. So for 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 Pia to uh, to be writing about this and then and then Bill and Lorraine to say, well, let's bring this back to Australia because they really believed in it. That that was a real uh, act of vision on their part. But what we know now. And, and um, I had the pleasure to speak to Pia earlier this year, arranged by Lorraine. It was, it, I felt like I was meeting Bruce Springsteen. I'd listened to so much of her tapes. It was, I was very grateful for it because I had a lot to ask her. But the biggest question was, at the moment, um, to deal with childhood trauma and, and trauma-focused therapy is the new standard. And, and we're arguing the toss over what we're going to call it, whether it's complex, uh, complex post-traumatic stress disorder or whether we call it uh, developmental trauma disorder one day in the future is Dr. Bessel van der Kolt's, uh, presenting um, to the Diagnostic Criteria Committee. Um, that's yet to be seen. But, but, but our model and the, and the model that Peer developed was ahead of its time because it, it, it noted that you've got to go to people's history and the weight of the history is through the physical body, through the viscera, through the nervous system and through the feeling state. Insight, just dealing with a cognitive model isn't enough. Um, and the other thing is that um, the other thing I thought she was ahead of her time on was the that it wasn't when we look at abuse, it's not just physical or sexual, it's not just overt abuse, but to look at that those underlying emotional and intellectual and, and sort of shaming abuses that seem to not go under the radar for a lot of folks. And as I said in the ACE study, that that's just been confirmed as uh, as as it sh shows the same amount of the same sort of symptoms as those more overt abuses. And 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 so I think that she's. Uh, you know, we were we we were once upon a time that kooky rehab over on the beaches, but these days, you know, the, whether it be the Department of Veteran Affairs or uh, the the insurance companies which we have contracts with, therapists in the community, uh, people send people here for their trauma now. They send people here for addictions that once upon a time people weren't even talking about. They send people here for co-occurring addictions. So we, I'm, I'm grateful that we work in a place like that and we have this place because I, I'm one of those folks that needed this sort of program. So the part one, quickly, is just getting our history straight, breaking through that minimization, the denial and the delusion. Uh, and, and so the homework, anyone that's done our changes program has done that first section. So when we run Life Skills 2 here, we ask them to bring that homework with them, or at least some journaling and some awareness, because you've done that hard work. We've, we've been educated in what trauma is and its impacts. We do a trauma log, and then we share that and uh, we, we share it in community. And, and, and shame reduction happens right from walking into sh a family of origin work with a therapist or in a group setting because we're breaking all the family rules about trauma, the don't talk, don't feel, don't trust. We're hanging that dirty washing out in, in public and people are looking back at us really differently. Their, their, their whole body language of, of acceptance and empathy and uh, the feedback we get all helps in the shame reduction. And then we start to reclaim our connection to our vulnerability through um, the inner child, precious child sort of process of visualization and the inner child model of just, just it's just a tool, but it's a very important tool of, of noting that, that up until now where I've been quite disappointed owning, abandoning or critical or attacking of that vulnerability that I'm now going to embrace it in a very, very different way. And we know now a lot about the power of belief and that power of belief that's created that, that about around being in touch with our vulnerability is what I think is at the core of people walking out of that week of changes going, wow, I, I, I think my therapist's a, a witch doctor. I don't know what they've done to me. But the fact we've just come home and really met that vulnerability again and feel connected to that preciousness is a huge part of the power of the program. So that's the first bit and, and, and so those, the things, again, the best way to see it is through the symptoms. So we start to see that wounded child inside. We see how it sees itself as less value. We see how we'll avoid conflict at all costs. We have difficulty saying no. We don't feel good enough or inadequate around others. Um, we, that we will take a one down position, make others needs and opinions more important than our own. We'll seek approval and esteem from others and we'll deny and ignore um, our reality. We'll just shut it down. 
the, the, the adapted self is better seen through the symptoms that there's low self-esteem but it's falsely empowered, we're better than, we see ourselves as superior than others sometimes, more entitled, uh, considers our needs more important than yours, uh, may feel special, uh, daddy's little princess, mummy's little man, when we look back at that childhood, uh, could be patronising or a know-it-all, grandiose, arrogant, put others down, find faults in others or people, places and things, nothing's ever good enough and we'll take a one-up position. And so those two things are where we see the symptoms in action. And, and I won't spend time too much time on this, but those symptoms, again, if you're not convinced about childhood trauma and w whether I was or wasn't, or it's still quite a, a, a sort of a misty area back there. What we're looking for when you come into treatment is what we know are symptoms of that childhood trauma. In regards to that less than, better than, we'll see we'll have, we'll have negative control issues when it comes to our relationships. And relationally, we find it very difficult not to go one up or one down. That regarding boundaries, if we've got that too vulnerable, invulnerable, we'll have resentment and rage and we'll find our relationships are either remeshing or abandoning. That we'll have a spiritual crisis, we'll have real difficulty owning our own reality and we'll notice that by how dishonest we are. I think dishonesty is one of those key symptoms. If you find you can't tell the truth to significant people, uh, that's something that's a real symptom of childhood trauma. That if you've got addiction issues, depression, anxiety or physical illness, problems with interdependence, that your relationships are based on intensity, you'll see those symptoms. And I think just, just flag that and talk to your therapist about it if that's helpful. So the second part of the book says, right, let's take this awareness we have about our codependent symptoms now and use the 12 steps in a very different way. Every other step in the other fellowships, for, like for Alcoholics Anonymous says we're powerless over alcohol or powerless over gambling. What Pia said, for the purpose of breaking free, we're going to look at the powerlessness I now have over me, the powerless I have when my core symptoms get triggered, all those things that I just talked about, that there's a powerlessness when they come up. And then when they come up and I'm trying to hide them and be dishonest and act like nothing's wrong or act out from that wound, I'm going to see signs of unmanageability in my life around my codependency. I'll see negative control. I'll see resentment. I'll have a distorted sense of self and spirituality. I'll avoid my own reality and, 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 and the reality of others. I'll see addictions, mental health issues, the physical illness, the paired ability to sustain relationships. That's when I'll start to see that first step. And she says, well, we need the other steps to help us deal with that powerlessness. <laughs> and so the 12 steps, I, won't, I, will, I will go through those now just really quickly if you don't know them. But for a lot of you out there, I'm sure you do. So for this one, we say we admitted we we're powerless over ourselves that our lives have become unmanageable, that we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity, that we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. We made a fearless and search, a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. We admitted to God, to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. We humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. We made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. We made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. That we continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong promptly admitted it that we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with, with, with him, praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Now, I want to go through just quickly, Pia uses that with those symptoms, the core uh, symptoms of codependency and the resulting unmanageability that comes with that. We then drill into the steps and the, and, and the, the, uh, the sort of principles that, that, that come with it to give us a greater understanding of, of how to move away from the, the the, just the symptoms of the trauma to develop that functional adult. So those key principles there take you through, uh, they're the principles that happen as a result of working the steps, the honesty it takes, the faith, the surrender, the soul searching, coming into our personal integrity, a deep acceptance of our defects of character, our imperfection, a humility then to ask for help with those, a willingness to look at who have I harmed by being in this disease. What happened to me, I'm powerless over. What I've done to others, I'm accountable for. To get to a state of forgiveness for myself first and for others. 
maintenance, so I do ongoing inventory, making contact with a power greater than self and then service, service to others to, to carry this, this and practice these principles in all our affairs. So that step one sets up that platform for the 12 steps. <clears throat> If I admit I'm powerless over myself and those symptoms and my life is unmanageable and I start to then work through those issues and get clear on what they are and that's what breaking free does, it, it then brings us to the step, second step. And the second step basically helps us to address that imperfection and to then reach out for a power greater than us. And, and in a lot of the fellowships that came after AA, they, they use the word God as you understand God. And for atheists and agnostics, that can just be a power greater than you, could be the group, could be the, the, the combination of a lot of other people in recovery is better than your own stinking thinking that, that, that got you here. So, so just step two is opening ourselves up to say that my best thinking got me here, I need some support to get out of here. Step three then comes along really quickly because if you're in that state saying I'm really powerless, life's really unmanageable and I need help, then step three brings us to that help. And one of the chapters I was really impressed by in Breaking Free is, is Pia just says, look, by the time you do step one and do step two, you are pretty well overwhelmed by just how big this thing is. And so, so you know, we, we get to that point where we want to hand our will and our life over to help us to grow up and to get well. And, and that's getting that support to, 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 to sort of get back in charge of our own life. So, so, so the rest of the steps, the, the, the next six steps are, the, are the, the, what they call the working steps of the program. <clears throat> Excuse me. Step four helps us to take responsibility for the authentic offences we've caused others as a result of those symptoms and unmanageabilities. So, so we can cause emotional, intellectual, physical, sexual and spiritual offences to others. Again, like I said, we're powerless over what happened to us. We dealt with that in, 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 in our family of origin work. This is using the steps now to see how I'm creating damage with, with my immaturity. Once I get a good picture of that, I share that with God or, or, or another, my sponsor or therapist, because that, that sharing helps us to, to pull out of that, that, that fourth step, um, the next few steps that's really important. Defects of character start to get identified, and, and this one's a biggie. This is, I remember when we got to this section in Breaking Free in the group, everyone was a bit overwhelmed, because what it does is it says, well, look, how has my defects then impacted other people? And if you've been in your codependency and immaturity, you've usually blamed everyone else for your behaviour. So this is really turning that sort of your eyeballs inside and saying, right, let's have a good look. So we look at those defence mechanisms. We look at dishonesty, resentment, perfectionism, striving for power, overcommitment, a loss of morality, blame, indecisiveness, control, helplessness, shutting others out, irresponsibility, explosive feelings and rage. And there's, this list can be longer. These are just a hint of how is, what, have I done any of those in my relationships with others and self and what's been the impact of that? And, and again, with the steps sort of involve that sort of spiritual relationship and power. So step seven then helps us with that awareness to then ask God to remove those defects. But I think I've always loved that saying faith without works is dead. So, so I ask God for help, but I continue to do that work on my program. I continue and the workbook gives you opportunities to write out, well, what, what was, what's the defect? What's the injury it's caused? But what are some of the, what are some of the qualities or what are some of the, the, um, uh, the, the character uh, traits I need to build as a result of that deficiency. And that's the work that happens in Breaking Free. Now, from your fourth step, it gives us that list of people we'd harm too. So, so we look at and we name those folks and we go through that list and we share that list with our sponsor because it leads to step nine where we're, where we're not to injure others or ourselves. We go back out and we, we sort of do that housekeeping that, 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 owns the impact that we've had on other people and and that gets rid of a lot of that guilt that we've carried for a long time because and 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 frees us from some of that resentment that 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 we've been lugging around with us so i think codependents are very famous for having a lot of people living rent free in their head Step 10 keeps us on track, it keeps us riding, it keeps us doing daily inventories and inpatient treatment. We ask you to do a daily moral inventory. How are you going? What's the, what's, what, keep us on track so we don't let this thing get build, build momentum and we get unwell again because this can we can regress fairly quickly in early recovery. So doing a regular step 10 can be helpful. Step 11 um, is, is then where we go, okay, that's the working steps. Now I need to, to build my relationship. And, and so step 11 is basically saying, look, 
through through this relationship with God and a higher power or whatever that's been for you, um, we need now to continue to develop that contact. Hopefully, you've got some real hardcore evidence now. You've 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 started to trust people. You've started to talk about yourself. You've started to reach out. You've looked at the worst parts of you and the, and how they've impacted people and made amends and and really. So, so hopefully, you've got some evidence from that where you've gone. Okay, I think I, I now need to do this step 11, which is through prayer and meditation, uh, develop a conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of God's will, whatever that higher power is for you. Now, the step 12 comes in and says, well, look, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of this. Now, when Pia Melody talks about this in The Intimacy Factor, she talks about the spiritual crisis that comes as a result of childhood trauma. When you disconnect from yourself, you disconnect from your own shame. And when, you, when you've did it disconnected from healthy shame, where you've got a shame core of a lot of character-induced shame, shame is, the, the shame is the healthy feeling. It lets me know I'm perfectly imperfect, and it opens me to that doorway at depth to a higher power, that 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 connection to self and that connection to that healthy shame and so step 12 comes along and says look have, a, having as a result of those steps we have had a spiritual awakening we're back in touch with ourselves again and from that then we can altruistically carry that story our own story out and help others um, by practicing the principles what principles those 12 that were mentioned before as a result of working these steps in our lives it's a big job, but I remember from running that group, I'm still running that very first group. We still, it's the group that never finishes. They always, you know, when I say, oh, well, our life skills three group still going. Those guys that did that, it does it, they're in their, their second year recovery now. We've probably been two years into that process and they're, 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 they're actually got the the benefits of those 12 steps they've got the ben benefits of the principles that you develop through that because part three comes along and says right we've got our history straight we've really unpacked and looked at the the symptoms and the unmanageability and the damage we've worked the steps and got our own program now and so step uh, the part three says well let's get beyond denial and and get really in recovery keep con and continue to build that functional adult and so breaking three at the end section leads us through those core symptoms and there's some really powerful tools. One of the tools for healthy self-esteem is that people, after they've identified their shame messages, identify what sort of affirmation they need to, to start to feel better about themselves. They tape that. These days we put it into our phone, but back when Peter developed this, we were still pressing uh, record on the tape player. And then you play it back to yourself, and it had a really profound effect. People, um, you know, Pia herself said she cried for six months when she'd listened to that because she had such deep shame and, and such painful shame messages. To hear her own voice speaking kind to her and not attacking and criticizing her was pretty powerful. So we start to build healthy esteem. We work on functional boundaries. We own our reality. We start to meet those needs and wants appropriately, and we get to live in moderation. So that Breaking Free book is, uh, is, is an incredibly powerful tool and, and I think our model sets us up not only to be in recovery from those secondary symptoms but to finally uh, get some healing from, uh, from, uh, of, of those, those, that, that wounding that happened. Now these 12 promises are from Codependence Anonymous, the 12-step fellowship that, that, that then said, well, what, how do we know I'm in my recovery? and what, what am I going to get back? And so these things just take us through that we're capable of developing healthy and loving relationships now that I don't need to control or manipulate and others won't disappear as I learn to trust. That to learn that it's possible to mend and repair. A lot of codependents didn't see repair, didn't see apologies, didn't see people owning their behaviour. And that then they have a choice in how they communicate with their family. It gets safe, it gets respectful. They acknowledge that I'm unique and precious and a creation of God, that I no longer need to rely solely on others. I can, my functional adult's stronger, I, I can reparent myself with support. That I trust the guidance that I get from a higher power, that, that prayer and meditation and praying only for God's will gives us that strength and serenity and spiritual growth. The 12 promises then are just that reflection and of, of the hope that can be gained. Years into recovery, um, uh, you know, I'm one of the people that was grateful that Lorraine brought this program back here. I'm one of the people that was grateful that, that Pia Malady blundered into this, as she said, because... Um, 
I got sober when I was 22 years old, and it's a miracle. It's still a miracle. I, my my uh, clean date's the 14th of the 4th, 86. But my codependency and the other issues that result of childhood trauma were something that this program, the NA gave me um, my life, but, but this work gave me my life back. It connected me to myself, to my spirit. And, and life's not perfect. I'm full of imperfections, but the shame is, is, is gone. And, and, and that's the miracle that happens. We, we're ambitious when we put this sign downstairs that expect a miracle when you come in here. But the miracle isn't from us. The miracle is if you just have the courage to turn up, if you have the courage to, get to, to let us see you in that shame and not believe its messages, then on the other side of that, you get you back. You get to connect to that vulnerability. And instead of attacking and criticizing or abandoning it, you start to open yourself up to the power of the universe here, stuff that, that I cannot begin to fully explain to you or understand. The, the miracles, the synchronicity and ser serendipity of recovery, little things start to come your way that you never might have expected. There's plenty of gifts in early recovery that are wrapped in newspaper, there's no doubt. But those promises arrive on our doorstep through the hard work of recovery. If you're out there listening, please don't do this on your own. Anyone that I see that has a decent and solid recovery has found the power of community. And if you're down in that Rock Castle room right now and still there, they might have sent you to group if I've gone over. But if you're still there, then that community that's there right now is your eyes and ears. They've got your back and, and, and we can be sometimes a, 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 a sort of a, we can, we can come from all walks of life, but once we make that decision, to get well and put ourselves in the company of others, then then we're a force to be reckoned with in recovery. And and I'll close on the fact that today, guys, whether you're going back to group or going back into your lives, or you're listening to this at another time. Uh, God bless you in your recovery. Remember, you are a miracle. And and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.